Welcome to the new Retina Radio Journal Club with VBS. My name is Kat Talcott. I'm a retina specialist at Coli Institute, Cleveland Clinic. I'm joined today by Phoebe Mellon, who practices in Pittsburgh. Thanks so much, Phoebe, for joining us. Thanks, Kat. Happy to be here. And Kyle Kovacs, who's at Cornell in New York City. Thanks so much, Kyle, for joining Thanks us for as well. Me. Awesome. And today we're going to be discussing a paper, Retina Vascular Occlusions Did Not Increase Since Start of the Coronavirus Pandemic in 2019 by Flora Lum et al. This was published in Ophthalmology Retina in January 2024. Kyle, I'm going to turn it over to you to summarize the paper. Thanks, Kat. Uh, this is a really interesting addition to the IRIS registry growing body of literature. Uh, but the authors sought to study how the COVID-19 pandemic impacted presenting numbers of retinal vascular occlusions, both arterial and uh, vein occlusions. So they looked at the IRIS registry database, which I think we probably all know at this point, but it's uh, about 2,600 ophthalmic practices with over 435 million individual patient visits encounters from over 73 million unique patients. Um, the, the authors used data from 2017 to 2019, looking at CRVO, BRVO, CRAO, BRAO, and they used those diagnoses to train models predicting the number of patients with each condition in the absence of the COVID-19 pandemic. And they compared those predictive observations with what they actually observed using the IRIS registry from 2020 to 2022 and compared those two things. So from 2020 to 2022, they found that the monthly number of patients documented with RVO remained at or below the expectations based on this predictive modeling. There was a significant drop seen in April 2020, which was after governments issued the stay-at-home orders and the Academy issued guidance on halting routine care in light of these orders. And the authors, I will just say, used an extension of an analytic framework they previously published, which they used to characterize care utilization during the first two years of the COVID pandemic. So it's supposed to, in some ways, account for this transition in the nature of ophthalmic care that occurred after April 2020. Due to pandemic restrictions, severe visits were found to comprise a larger share of overall visits, which the authors felt could lead to misleading perception of an increase in the incidence of rates of RVO. Um, and so this AAO study using the IRIS registry contradicts a previous study by Kaiser Permanente out of Southern California that suggested there had been a true increase in the diagnosis of retinal vein occlusion following COVID-19 infection. So the authors overall felt that there is a, there is a credible biologic mechanism that could link SARS-CoV-2 and retinal vascular occlusions. But this particular large database study did not confirm a larger number of impacted patients than would be expected. And I think that then would be expected is the key part here. Thanks so much for that great um, summary of the paper. Phoebe, any quick like reactions to um, the paper? Yeah, a uh, great summary, Kyle. Um, I found this study very interesting interesting due to the sheer number of visits that the registry is really able to capture and examine. Um, as you meant, as Kyle mentioned, the IRIS registry covers over 2,500 ophthalmic practices. So it gives a really good bird's eye view of what's going on uh, in this paper, specifically on a month to month basis across the nation. So they examine these monthly visits uh, and compared 2017 to 2019 versus 2020 to 2022 at these monthly averages. Um, and as Kyle mentioned, we saw a deep dive in the number of total patient visits, which we all felt in the clinic. Uh, and we also all felt that the visits, you know, for higher acuity diagnoses uh, made up the higher prevalence uh, of the patients that we were seeing. So, you know, day to day, I felt like we felt the burden or we felt, you know, the people coming in uh, that higher proportion, uh, you know, made us think or feel that uh, those numbers may have been going up. Um, during the pandemic, so much was unknown and everyone was really trying to piece together how this new entity was going to shape or change our field and what kind of impact it was going to have on our patients. So we had all heard about COVID associated uh, retinal vein occlusions and retinal artery occlusions, but it's really interesting to me to see that this year numbers really did not seem to increase. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, you know, one of the benefits of using the IRIS database is you have you know, you, you can really sort of look across at just a large volume of patients. And I think you captured really well that, you know, while emotionally, I think a lot of us felt like we were seeing more of things, um, 
it was definitely a skewed time in which the patients we were seeing were a little different. Kyle, any thoughts there? Yeah, I, I think we're also skewed by like temporal associations too, that like COVID-19 infections and RVOs, I mean, RVOs are not un entirely uncommon diagnosis in our practice. And when you have a common thing that's happening universally, like COVID-19 infection in those times, then it's we start to see these associations or impute these associations. And I think it's really important that we have such good big data analytics to help break down those sort of inferences that we're making off the cuff. I think that's a really good point. All right, we're gonna take a break um, and then we're going to take a deeper dive into this paper after our break, thanks. Welcome back to the new Retina Radio Journal Club with a VBS. Let's get into a longer conversation about the paper that Kyle Kovacs very nicely summarized. Um, one of the things that I was sort of struck by in hearing about this paper is that it really resonated for me some of the conversations that I've had with patients over the past few years um, where they um, ascribe certain sort of ocular conditions um, to COVID or the COVID vaccine. And I was curious if you guys had experienced that as well. Phoebe, is that something that you've experienced um, over the past couple of years hearing from, from patients that they're concerned that COVID or having the vaccine might have caused an eye problem? Definitely. I definitely have patients coming in from time to time, whether it's, you know, really whether it's COVID, COVID vaccination, you know, I recently had the flu, I recently had XYZ happen, I got hit in the eye, and then X symptom happened, you know, trying to uh, kind of figure out what caused their eye condition. Um, and it can be really hard to kind of suss out the causation, you know, cause and effect with these patients, uh, especially when something like RVO, which has, you know, a number of risk factors that a lot of our patients have, we see in uh, generally an elderly population, uh, hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia being very common, uh, it can be very hard uh, to, you know, really assess causality in these patients. Patients. Um, and when they have a lot of other risk factors, we really don't know how this comes into play. Um, and uh, trying to explain that to patients, you know, we may never really know uh, whether or not COVID impacted your diagnosis, uh, but trying to kind of walk them through what the next few months look like or what their treatment looks like and how, you know, we're going to conquer this together or we're going to handle it together. I think, you know, hope, I hope try to kind of steer the direction down, you know, the future rather than looking back at the past as to what may have, you know, happened before. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think I'm surprised that I'm still sort of hearing from patients that they're worried that either the retinal vein occlusion or um, like a uveitis flare might be caused by sort of COVID or sort of another infection. Um, and that's why it's helpful, I think, to have studies such as this that have looked really sort of a large databases to try and be able to answer that. I'm curious, Kyle, how do you address this with patients if they bring it up? Would you find a paper like this helpful? Do you mention this type of literature to patients at all? Like how, how do you approach these situations? I think I think it depends entirely on on the patient and their like ability to reason through things, and I mean that not in ability, but sort of like a, a a logical framework for the world. I think a lot of a lot of the times, as an individual, it's easy to do sort of like an inductive logic where you're like you go from this happened to me and impute causality from it, and like this kind of paper is the exact opposite of that, where we're starting from a global and working down to a single takeaway point, and it's sometimes hard to trust that kind of logic or data it's in like an entirely different way of reasoning about the world and so i think some people latch on to data and analysis better than others and i have others who literally just say i just don't believe you or i just don't believe it because that's contradictory to my personal experience right mm -hmm. so i think this is a, a great tool for some of our patients and for others it ultimately comes down to like you don't trust what i'm saying which is a really difficult conversation to have, right? Because they're looking for causal relationships that apparently aren't aren't there. Mm -hmm. So yeah, for some. Yeah, I think I think I totally agree. There's some patients who I have who you know um, actually come in with things like retinal vein occlusions, and um, you know I'll sort of go over you know that you have X, Y, and Z risk factor. We need to make sure your sort of high blood pressure, your sort of high cholesterol is like under control. And there's some people who it feels like aren't hearing those things at all. And then I have other patients who will come in with a retinal vein occlusion and they'll be like, why aren't you adopting this research that's done at like whatever premier academic institution? And I'm like, I, I don't even know what you're talking about. Like, I, I don't even know what basic science this is. And 
I, I don't think it's ready for you. So it's interesting that there's really like a big, a big spread of where people are at. But I think the other thing that um, you mentioned too was sort of a little bit about this paper and sort of the um, database overall. And it, I was really struck by reading the paper, how much of, I think this project was really um, uh, started because of a paper that had come out from the Kaiser group in Southern California, where they did find a change. And I'm just curious, Kyle, do, do you have any thoughts as to why you thought this IRIS study might've found a difference? Is there something about the IRIS database that's a little different than, than their database? Well, I think this is like, first of all, a great exercise in academic medicine is to, to strive for repeatability with different data sets. And like the authors here mentioned that too, that there's all these different criteria for, for finding causal relationships and repeatability with different data is, a, I think, a really important part of that. So I think it's a great effort, even when studies are negative, to do this kind of thing, because it's important to validate work that's done with certain cohorts, because you kind of never know. I, I the the iris is a, an amazing tool, and we sometimes forget though that it doesn't capture all ophthalmologists. So, like our academic center, for example, is not a participant in the iris registry, and I do wonder that there was also a major transition in in care uh, in how ophthalmic care was delivered post twenty twenty. And we don't always know exactly where some of this data may be captured. So I don't, you know, I, I know the authors talk about how they're modeling a little bit differently at 2020 and the years after. Are these some of the RVOs showing up at the academic centers that aren't being captured in the IRIS? Uh, who, who's to tell, right? Um, but I, I do think that the IRIS is a wonderful, wonderful resource. And obviously it's important to be asking this question, but there are some limitations of what it does capture. Yeah, any thoughts on that, Phoebe? Yeah, I really think, uh, you know, I completely agree. I think the IRIS registry is an incredible tool and it gives an amazing bird's eye view of kind of what's going on. Like we talked about what's going on at the nation at the time across many different centers. It obviously doesn't capture uh, every center, or all, all, all ophthalmologic care. Um, the Kaiser study was also really interesting because it looked specifically at about 400,000 patients and kind of examined the incidence of these vascular occlusions 26 weeks before COVID diagnosis, and then the 26 weeks after COVID diagnosis. And so it, it almost took more of like a patient-centered approach looking specifically at these patients, whereas uh, our study looked a bit more, I would say like a bit more of a global perspective. So uh, they're just uh, different in what they're actually looking at. Uh, but I think they both uh, are very interesting in their own right. And this just gives us uh, kind of an interesting take on, you know, uh, just sheer numbers of patients coming into clinic that can help to, you know, educate our patients or talk to our patients about the incidence of RVO before and after COVID. And that's a really good point. It's nice to have the study here as sort of a counterpoint to that article. But I think when you're doing these large sort of um, studies, just depending on a little differences in the population or what's captured, sometimes you get different answers. But I think it's it's nice and I think it's reassuring as a retina specialist to see the results that they found by taking that bird's eye view that Iris is so good, as you mentioned. Well, I think this was a great conversation. Um, I want to thank the audience so much for listening into our new Retina Radio Journal Club. And please stay tuned for further episodes. Thanks so much, Phoebe and Kyle, for your insights. Thank you.